The Wonderful Window by Lord Dunsany The old man in the oriental-looking robe was being moved on by the police, and it was this that attracted to him, and the parcel under his arm, the attention of Mr. Sladden, whose livelihood was earned in the emporium of Messrs. Merrigan and Chatter, that is to say, in their establishment. Mr. Sladden had the reputation of being the silliest young man in business. A touch of romance, a mere suggestion of it, would send his eyes gazing away as though the walls of the emporium were of gossamer and London itself a myth, instead of attending to customers. Merely the fact that the dirty piece of paper that wrapped the old man's parcel was covered with Arabic writing was enough to give Mr. Sladden the idea of romance, and he followed until the little crowd fell off and the stranger stopped by the curb and unwrapped his parcel and prepared to sell the thing that was inside it. It was a little window in old wood with small panes set in lead. It was not much more than a foot in breadth and was under two feet long. Mr. Sladden had never before seen a window sold in the street, so he asked the price of it. "'Its price is all you possess,' said the old man. "'Where did you get it?' said Mr. Sladden, for it was a strange window. "'I gave all that I possessed for it in the streets of Baghdad.' "'Did you possess much?' said Mr. Sladden. "'I had all that I wanted.' he said, except this window. It must be a good window, said the young man. It is a magical window, said the old one. I have only ten shillings on me, but I have fifteen and six at home. The old man thought for a while. Then twenty-five and sixpence is the price of the window, he said. It was only when the bargain was completed and the ten shillings paid, and the strange old man was coming for his fifteen and six, and to fit the magical window into his only room, that it occurred to Mr. Sladden's mind that he did not want a window. And then they were at the door of the house in which he rented a room, and it seemed too late to explain. The stranger demanded privacy while he fitted up the window, so Mr. Sladden remained outside the door at the top of a little flight of creaky stairs. He heard no sound of hammering. And presently the strange old man came out with his faded yellow robe and his great beard and his eyes on far-off places. It is finished, he said, and he and the young man parted and whether he remained a spot of color and an anachronism in London, or whether he ever came again to Baghdad, and what dark hands kept on the circulation of his twenty-five and six, Mr. Sladden never knew. Mr. Sladden entered the bare-boarded room in which he slept, and spent all his indoor hours between closing time and the hour at which Messrs. Merrigan and Chatter commenced. To the penedies of so dingy a room, his neat frock coat must have been a continual wonder. Mr. Sladden took it off and folded it carefully, and there was the old man's window, rather high up in the wall. There had been no window in that wall hitherto, nor any ornament at all, but a small cupboard. So when Mr. Sladden had put his frock coat safely away, he glanced through his new window. It was where his cupboard had been, in which he had kept his tea-things. They were all standing on the table now. When Mr. Sladden glanced through his new window, it was late in a summer's evening. The butterflies, some while ago, would have closed their wings, though the bat would scarcely yet be drifting abroad. But this was in London. The shops were shut, and street lamps were not yet lighted. Mr. Sladden rubbed his eyes, then rubbed the window, and still he saw a sky of blazing blue, and far, far down beneath him, so that no sound came up from it or smoke of chimneys, a medieval city set with towers, brown roofs and cobbled streets, and then white walls and buttresses, and beyond them bright green fields and tiny streams. On the towers archers lolled, and along the walls were pikemen, 
and now and then a wagon went down some old world street and lumbered through the gateway and out to the country and now and then a wagon drew up to the city from the mist that was rolling with evening over the fields sometimes folk put their heads out of lattice windows sometimes some idle troubadour seemed to sing and nobody hurried or troubled about anything airy and dizzy though the distance was for mr sladden seemed higher above the city than any cathedral gargoyle yet one clear detail he obtained as a clue the banners floating from every tower over the idle archers had little golden dragons all over a pure white field he heard motor buses roar by his other window he heard the newsboys howling mr sladden grew dreamier than ever after that on the premises in the establishment of messieurs merrigan and chatter but in one matter he was wise and wakeful he made continuous and careful inquiries about golden dragons on a white flag and talked to no one of his wonderful window he came to know the flags of every king in europe he even dabbled in history he made inquiries at shops that understood heraldry but nowhere could he learn any trace of little dragons or on a field argent and when it seemed that for him alone those golden dragons had fluttered he came to love them as an exile in some desert might love the lilies of his home or as a sick man might love swallows when he cannot easily live to another spring as soon as messieurs merrigan and chatter closed mr sladden used to go back to his dingy room and gaze through the wonderful window until it grew dark in the city and the guard would go with the lantern round the ramparts and the night came up like velvet full of strange stars another clue he tried to obtain one night by jotting down the shapes of the constellations but this led him no further for they were unlike any that shone upon either hemisphere each day as soon as he woke he went first to the wonderful window and there was the city diminutive in the distance all shining in the morning and the golden dragons dancing in the sun and the archers stretching themselves or swinging their arms on the tops of the windy towers the window would not open so that he never heard the songs that the troubadour sang down there beneath gilded balconies he did not even hear the belfry's chimes though he saw the jackdaws routed every hour from their homes and the first thing that he always did was to cast his eye round all the little towers that rose up from the ramparts to see that the little golden dragons were flying there on their flags and when he saw them flaunting themselves on white folds from every tower against the marvellous deep blue of the sky he dressed contentedly and taking one last look went off to his work with a glory in his mind it would have been difficult for the customers of messieurs mergen and chatter to guess the precise ambition of mr sladden as he walked before them in his neat frock coat it was that he might be a man-at-arms or an archer in order to fight for the little golden dragons that flew on a white flag for an unknown king in an inaccessible city at first mr sladden used to walk round and round the mean street that he lived in but he gained no clue from that and soon he noticed that quite different winds blew below his wonderful window from those that blew on the other side of the house in august the evenings began to grow shorter this was the very remark that the other employees made to him at the emporium so that he almost feared that they suspected a secret and he had much less time for the wonderful window for lights were few down there and they blinked out early one morning in late august just before he went to business mr sladden saw a company of pikemen running down the cobbled road towards the gateway of the medieval city golden dragon city he used to call it alone in his own mind but he never spoke of it to anyone the next thing that he noticed was that the archers on the towers were talking a good deal together and were handling round bundles of arrows in addition to the quivers which they wore heads were thrust out of windows more than usual a woman ran out 
and called some children indoors. A knight rode down the street, and then more pikemen appeared along the walls, and all the jackdaws were in the air. In the street, no troubadour sang. Mr. Sladden took one look along the towers to see that the flags were flying, and all the golden dragons were streaming in the wind. Then he had to go to business. He took a bus back that evening and ran upstairs. Nothing seemed to be happening in Golden Dragon City except a crowd in the cobbled street that led down to the gateway. The archers seemed to be reclining as usual, lazily in their towers. Then a white flag went down with all its golden dragons. He did not see at first that all the archers were dead. The crowd was pouring towards him, towards the precipitous wall from which he looked. Men with a white flag covered with golden dragons were moving backwards slowly. Men with another flag were pressing them, a flag on which there was one huge red bear. Another banner went down upon a tower. Then he saw it all. The golden dragons were being beaten, his little golden dragons. The men of the bear were coming under the window. Whatever he threw from that height would fall with terrific force. Fire irons, coal, his clock, whatever he had, he would fight for his little golden dragons yet. A flame broke out from one of the towers and licked the feet of a reclining archer. He did not stir. And now the alien standard was out of sight directly underneath. Mr. Sladden broke the panes of the wonderful window and wrenched away with the poker the lead that held them. Just as the glass broke, he saw a banner covered with golden dragons fluttering still. And then, as he drew back to hurl the poker, there came to him the scent of mysterious spices. And there was nothing there, not even the daylight. For behind the fragments of the wonderful window was nothing but that small cupboard in which he kept his tea things. And though Mr. Sladden is older now, and knows more of the world, and even has a business of his own. He has never been able to buy such another window, and has not ever since, either from books or men, heard any rumor at all of Golden Dragon City.